and welcome to this edition of EMS Now Up Close. I am Eric Miskell with EMS Now, and it is my pleasure today to uh, get to speak with Misha from Macrofab again. It's been a while since we last spoke, um, and he runs an exciting and very interesting company, which allows him a, a certain perspective on uh, on the industry that I always appreciate. So, so Misha, it is good to see you. I'm glad we have this opportunity at the end of the year. Likewise, Eric, I always uh, enjoy our chats. And uh, uh, I was just thinking back to when I first joined Macrofab. I think you were one of the first uh, people to interview us. And the company was much, much smaller uh, at that point. So it's really, you know, every time we talk, uh, it's a checkpoint into how much we've grown since then. Well, that's good. Well, listen, let's start right there. Why don't you give to give context to what we're going to discuss today, kind of provide a, an overview of the business of Macrofab and the scope of the services. Yeah, of course. Uh, Macrofab is a, um, um, a manufacturing platform for uh, electronics. And what I mean by platform is that we address a number of problems for our customers. First of all, we're certainly a manufacturer. We build products for our customers. And these products, uh, this is somewhat unique. There are, customer, there are manufacturers out there that build, they really specialize in high mix, low volume. There are manufacturers out there that specialize in mid volume and then high volume. Uh, we actually go the spectrum all the way from uh, small prototypes and you, you can literally order a couple of units on your credit card and we'll ship it to you in as quickly as 10 days, all the way to you know customers that are doing hundreds of thousands of units of fully assembled products, fully tested. Uh, we have uh, in-house engineering team, uh, we we uh, we really build uh, products for customers at very high scale, but behind the scenes, there is software and technology that drives it all, which is why we call it uh, a platform. So just like the rest of the world has gotten digitized and we've seen uh, digitization affect everything from travel to logistics with companies like uh, uh, Uber Freight and uh, in Flexport, we're doing the exact same thing with manufacturing. Um, so uh, when you place orders with us, uh, we have our own software technology stack that uh, that that tracks all of the jobs, orders the components, assures that we know exactly how many components you have in you in our warehouses for you as a customer. Uh, we can give customers either web-based through the web interface or API-based reporting on exactly which components we have in stock for them and and give them clear to build reporting. So it's a very modern way to build products, but the the proof is really in how well it works, right? And, uh, you know, unfortunately in the electronics manufacturing industry, the net promoter score, and that's the key measure of customer satisfaction is usually about negative three. Ours is 67 and it has been 67 for the last three to four quarters. Very hard to do. It's it's actually in the enterprise space when you deal with business to business services, 25 is good, 45 is kind of best in class. So I'm incredibly proud of the fact that the team is able to hit 67. That is one of those consumer technology uh, numbers. Uh, but I think that's a testament to just how different the model is and how reliably it works for our customers. Yeah, no, absolutely. Kudos to you on that. And and just to be clear, this is still North American based though, right? That's correct. Uh, we, we started out uh, in Texas. So, you know, we, we're just about four hours drive uh, away from you. Uh, have two locations that are physical locations for us. These are our um, uh, supply chain logistics and manufacturing hubs. So we have Houston, where we have about a 48,000 square foot facility. There is an 18,000 square foot facility in Guadalajara. And then we have a network of over 100 factories all across North America. And that means Canada, US, and Mexico. And some of these factories are massive. Some of these factories are multiple football field sizes. Um, uh, some of them are small. Uh, and a lot of what our software does is use algorithms to figure out which job is going to get built the best possible way on which factory. With Macrofab really owning the delivery, owning the quality uh, for our customers, so we are the manufacturer of record. But ultimately, we have no limits to uh, how many products we can build for customers and then how many factories. For some customers, we build in multiple factories. But the key problem we solve for customers is uh, how do I scale up? But more important these days how do I keep my manufacturing in North America, even when I need to go to low cost, high volume manufacturing? It used to be that Asia was the only answer for that. And now more and more people are realizing 
you don't have to be Ford uh, or uh, one of the large automakers to use Mexico as your manufacturing center. A lot of our production volume actually is 50-50 split between U.S. A little bit in Canada. I wouldn't say Canada is, uh, uh, we probably do about 5% of our production in Canada, but it's about 50-50 U.S. and Canada. And that's really what happens, we believe, when you provide true liquidity in the factory marketplace. All of a sudden, you realize that it's not about um, uh, the factory. It's about the factory capabilities, right? And for some people, U.S. is a better option between delivery and quality and uh, and flexibility. U.S. is a overwhelming right choice. And for some customers, especially if they're leaving China, the only country that can match that in North America is Mexico. Mexico. Absolutely. And listen, that's a great setup for, for what I wanted to discuss with you today, which is that term, uh, you know, is that manufacturing that's shifting from Asia that's, 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 they, I guess the, the popular term currently is reshoring, although I like the term that we're going to use here, which is exshoring, right? Which is that collective term for, you know, people call it nearshoring, friend shoring, offshoring, reshoring, all of those shoring, right? The, the shifting of electronics manufacturing uh, back to certain regions. Um, tell me from your experience and what you're seeing, how strong is this movement and what exactly are you seeing there? I would say it's responsible for at least 50% uh, of our growth. And by the way, you know, when you, you and I met originally, it was before the pandemic. And I would say the exshoring uh, discussion was primarily make believe. I think there was a lot of people that talked about it. You know, we we did silly things like count a number of times. Somebody mentioned that on an earnings call, but there was very little going on. And in fact, I think that's very much in full swing. But for a lot of people, you know, they really fail to realize just how large manufacturing is and fail to realize just how long it takes to turn that tanker uh, around, right? So when we say there's a big exshoring wave coming and it's happening now, it doesn't mean that there are companies that are pulling up stakes out of China entirely and moving all of it somewhere else. In fact, a lot of customers that we're dealing with, um, they are really looking to, to de-risk their exposure to Asia. So what they're looking at is um, how much production do I do either close to home where my customers are versus around the world where I could be subject to some kind of a geopolitical shock. Uh, the first step they take is de-risk that by 25%. So they'll often come to us and say, look, I love the fact that you have a footprint that's exactly where I want to be. My objective is to make sure that I get started. And that means about 25% of my production. They're not walking away from China. Uh, I don't think their objective is to walk away from China. Frankly, I'm not sure if it's necessarily possible or necessary, right? I just think it's simply that a lot of companies have realized we are too dependent on China. And there are certain industries where we probably should be building over 50% of all product in North America and maybe even US and we have offshore too much. So to me, it's a rebalancing mechanism, but it's absolutely happening. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I think executives are very much making those decisions about uh, where their manufacturing should be and what their supply chain flows around the world look like. Yeah. So are there particular manufacturing sectors that are maybe the most primed for this uh, exshoring? Um, I think it's, first of all, I think it's agnostic across all sectors, but it doesn't mean that it's going to happen to, uh, it, it's going to rebalance the same countries universally. So to give you an example, um, I don't think consumer electronics production is coming to North America anytime soon or ever nor do, do I think it needs to, right? That's not a mission critical uh, supply chain. It doesn't affect our national security. So, you know, all the consumer devices that we buy, especially from companies like Google, Apple, um, uh, Amazon, right? They require very, very high volume. A lot of times these are low margin jobs. They're, you know, so a lot of times they're gonna rebalance out of China, probably into India, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam is obviously bursting at the seams, absorbing a lot of manufacturing. But there are also other industries that I think are much more in a critical path to supply chain resilience, right? Uh, in any sort of scenario where we have to enter a hot war, certainly defense industry, not just the actual weapon production, because that's already done in the US. I'm talking about auxiliary industries, right? Uh, uh, computing, right? A lot of that needs to really come closer to our contiguous 
uh, uh, continent, right? So uh, industrial is uh, companies, robotics, uh, a lot of AI development, drone development, a lot of these products, they're not actually high volume products. And in fact, what's really important is, is intellectual property a major factor in what you're building? If that's the case, the North America is the right choice. And again, there's plenty of manufacturing capacity in this continent, but you, you're going to get better economics in all honesty for consumer products somewhere else. Right. Yeah. And I should also say, in a balanced view, this is also a, a phenomenon that's being experienced in Europe. Is there some reshoring or exshoring that's coming back, you know, within that region? And they're taking some steps similar to what's happening in North America. That's right. By the way, I, um, and, and we're we're a relatively small business, so I'm not sure if this is indicative. But we had a lot of uh, European companies reach out to us earlier this year, and they were looking for North American production capacity. And for them. It was a strategic choice. Look, 60% of our customers are in North America. I want to get manufacturing closest to my customers. But we really didn't win most of those deals. Most of the deals that we won are North American companies bringing production closer to their customers, but also to themselves, right? They're trying to limit the number of flights their engineers have to take. And there's a big difference between flying from Chicago to Guadalajara, right, versus flying from from uh from Dresden uh, to uh, to Mexico City, right? So um, what we've seen is that people are generally contracting back to their home base, right? They're bringing a lot. And, and, and by the way, there's plenty of manufacturing facilities in Europe. Uh, Eastern Europe in particular has a lot of, uh, you know, very, very smart people that are very good at building products. So we see uh, local efforts for, for a lot of Europe to move production to uh, Eastern Europe. And we see a lot of North American companies utilize North America. Right? Yeah. So before I, there's a couple of things I'd like to unpack there. One, I guess, would be, you know, there's a geopolitical element to this, obviously, right, that that, that occurred kind of post-COVID. Um, do you see that as kind of a continuing trend or kind of a, is this... Is this a correction, as you said it, or a rebalancing that once in balance, maybe it's going to be sustainable there? Yeah. You know, it's it's dangerous for a couple of guys like us to talk about geopolitics because, um, <laughs> you know, the experts are usually wrong. So that means we'll probably yeah. be wrong as well. Yeah. Um, but look, nothing that I've seen recently tells me that things are about to get back to whatever we had before. Right. right. Um, we as a country were much more willing to go around the world and enforce peace and stability everywhere. And we've really just pulled back in a lot of ways. I think we're really deciding which regions matter to us most. Um, if Look, at the, we, we just saw Venezuela vote on whether they want to annex a piece of Guyana, you know. So exactly. um, so I'm not sure if the world where, um, where stability is prized above everything else is necessarily on a horizon. If, if anything, I think we should... Resilience to me means not predicting where the next... Um, fault line is going to be, but being ready for it, right? And and I think that's where we need to be building towards. But again, um, every year that goes on, we add yet another vector by which the world is getting a little bit more unpredictable, right? We did not anticipate um, a major escalation in the Middle East. Um, uh, we Nobody thought uh, uh, Russia was going to invade Ukraine. Now we have a debate about whether China is going to make a move on uh, Taiwan, but frankly, nobody knows, right? And in fact, um, I think these things are unpredictable. I come from a cybersecurity world, and the right risk management answer is not to make a decision. It's to really understand the range of possible outcomes and then target your decision making to the most likely range of outcomes. So from that perspective, it doesn't matter. Uh, whether we can predict it or not, we should build it so it's resilient. And you can have, we should be, uh, this is my advice to all the supply chain executives, <clears throat> map out your entire supply chain, look at where your components are coming from, where you do final assembly, uh, where you have the most critical people. And the more of it you believe is in regions that you believe could be at risk at some point, right? And if you're crossing an ocean, that's probably too far, right? Uh, the more I would be concerned about the integrity of your supply chain. Because guess what? It doesn't matter if most of your customers are in North America and your final assembly is in North America. Let's say you work with Microfab and we get you into a phenomenal factory in Mexico. If 80% of your raw materials come from China, 
it doesn't matter. You, you are still very much subject to whatever happens with China, which could be nothing, or it could be very, very uh, uh, damaging to your supply chain. So people really need to get a, a, a really good handle on where their mater materials come from. And in some cases, pay more, right? It's fine. Yeah. Uh, we can, uh, you know, this is, and I'm, I'm not going to call it a benefit, but I think a side effect of the inflation is that we no longer believe that things should cost the same amount of money year after year. That's not always the right answer. And in fact, I think there are certain things that are overvalued, such as software. And I think there are certain things that are undervalued, such as electronics, right? That's not just because I'm in this industry. I think if you just look at gross margin levels between software and hardware businesses, there's a wide disparity between them. It is purely because the world has been has been too flat. There's been uh, way too much transparency in, in the supply chain and not enough transparency in, in a software world. And I think we need to equalize it, right? I think we need to make sure that, uh, it, look, I, I give this advice to our, to, to our prospects. Whether you work with us or not, take a look at your uh, EMS partners. If you're paying to them less than seems reasonable and their financials are shaky, what have you won other than an unstable supplier that could go out of business at any moment, right? Yeah. Liz, I really appreciate your comments here. It reminds me of a, a colleague uh, I used to work with years ago who used to always say supply chain risk. He always broke it down to the number of time zones that you put between where it was ordered and where it was fulfilled, right? The more, the greater the risk, the fewer, the less the risk, right? So it's it, it's a simplistic way of looking at it, but that is kind of I, I point. think we really let ourselves to believe that it doesn't matter. And the, the answer yeah. is it does. The, the, I yeah. think that ship is sailing, right? Yeah, yeah. Hey, let, let's get back to the, and the other piece I wanted to unpack, there was, was the whole China. You've touched on it a bit, but this whole, the perception that people are pulling everything out of China, and that that's really not realistic or feasible, really. But uh, um, but it is kind of, people talk about the China plus one kind of, you know, strategy in their manufacturing now. Uh, what are those challenges associated with kind of that decoupling that companies experience? Um, I think single sourcing is probably the biggest issue, right? And uh, it's not it's not just that, um, and, and by the way, this problem is pervasive and it happens all across the entire supply chain. I think we all know about uh, situations where, you know, certain capacitors are just not valuable enough to be produced in multiple factories. And there is one location in the world that builds almost all of the world's supply, when there's a fire at that factory, all of a sudden, uh, everybody feels that pain, right? Take that sort of concentration risk and apply it to pretty much any company out there, right? So uh, th th this is just basic basic economics. You can, get, you can save another 3% on your raw materials if you order them from one company rather than two uh, and order them from suppliers in different countries. Uh, maybe it's not worth saving the three percent, and I think this is part. You know, this is part where the C-suite has to make it easier for supply chain people to make the right decisions because something has to give, right? Uh, if you're going to ask your supply chain team to be resilient, then you also have to give them the tools in order to make that happen. And that means multi-sourcing. That means stress testing your supply chain. That means knowing that you have multiple suppliers that are really in multiple regions. And, and you really got to decide what is your objective, right? Is your objective the lowest possible price or is it ultimate business continuity where things like COVID, things like wars breaking out around the world really don't affect you, right? Because they could affect your competition, right? Let's be honest, this um, I think this um, supply chain resiliency story is going to play out over the course of about 20 years. And I personally believe there'll be some uh, uh, companies out there that use it to their advantage, and there'll be some customers that go out of people that go out of business because they made wrong decisions, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Now, a related issue in all this is is obviously the the uh, the governmental action in support of of you know certain trends, and that's you know for the electrification electrification provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act. This is an example of that. Other U.S. policies. Um, you know, we see the, uh, you know, a group that we, I speak to a lot, the Printed Circuit Board Association of America, you know, with their drive to bring uh, PCB fabrication back into North America. There's a similar movement in Europe to, to kind of retrieve that because that's, as they say, chips don't float. You got to put them on something, right? So how do you see uh, that movement? Uh, I, I think it's all heading in the right direction. 
I am very worried that people are going to get bored of the topic and move on to something else. And there's a lot of exciting stuff out there, right? Uh, there is boardroom drama with open AI and like, there's no shortage of ways to di distract yourself. I, I think the CHIPS Act has been a phenomenal success. If you actually look at the data and the amount of money uh, countries around the world have, uh, have used in order to foster their local semiconductor um, uh, production, the, the stimulus package that we put together is a good start. It's mm -hmm. not the end, and I think it needs to extend beyond uh, beyond the chips, right? That needs to get into uh, first of all technologies that are not in a, in a straight line for uh, semiconductor production, right? There was a famous story a couple of months ago about uh, people thought it was really comical that um, Apple is going to start using TSMC in Arizona to build advanced chips, but they're going to have to go back to Taiwan for packaging. Well, right. a couple of days ago there was a story that that problem was now solved. There will be a, a packaging manufacturer in Arizona that's going to take care of that problem. That's an example where people are starting to realize it's not just semiconductors. There's a whole supply chain around them. And some of these things are not glamorous, right? And I think PCBs fall in that category. I would actually, you know, if it was me writing the bills, I recognize that, um, that we need to bring more of it into the U.S., but I actually would use Mexico as part of the answer as well. At the end of the day, um, uh, only 5% of PCB manufacturing today happens in the United States. It's in a lot of mom and pop uh, shops. There's only a handful of factories out there that are really there kind of sustaining themselves on national defense production. In order for us to really get above 10%, it's not going to be just the United States, right? Uh, I think in order to be price competitive with uh, uh, with Taiwan, uh, South Korea, and China, th those are the top three PCB manufacturers in the world out there. I think Mexico has to be in a mix. And am I suggesting that we should use American money to stimulate Mexican PCB fabrication? I'm not necessarily saying that, but I do think that this is one of the areas where we need to stop treating uh, Mexico as a, as a trade adversary in a lot of ways. And treat them as a partner, encourage them to pass their own legislation, making it easier to do PCB fabrication there, and pass their own incentives, right? I think we, we have a lot of, by the way, we've done this, right? We have scoured all over Mexico to find local PCB suppliers in Mexico. They don't exist. There's a yeah. handful of PCB fabs in Mexico. We found one in Brazil. They thought we were joking and they hung up the phone when we called them originally. So Look, both of the Americas don't have enough PCB fabrication capacity. And frankly, I would love to see a situation where 50% of the PCB, uh, raw PCB capacity that we source as, as an EMS industry is sourced from either North or South America. There's no reason why that can't happen, right? No, absolutely. And you underscore the, the important point I wanted to get to, too, which is that Mexico is going to be a big beneficiary of, of this whole exshoring movement. Uh, and so what are you seeing going on down? You've touched on a few of it, but elaborate. You know, we, we have a growing team in Mexico. So uh, our our office is in Guadalajara. So I, I'm actually heading out there tomorrow. Uh, and um, so we see uh, it's always been Guadalajara has always been a great location for electronics manufacturing. Uh, but we have factories all over um uh, all over Mexico at this point, and anything from Tijuana to Monterey, uh, Corretado, right? Um, so Mexico is really ramping up. And you can, you, when you go to Mexico, you see more and more construction cranes, more and more factories getting built. We're one of the mechanisms that really takes those factories and fills them up with jobs, right? I think mm -hmm. Mexico is going to be incredibly important. I think um, our friends in China realize this as well. Right. If you look at who's building factories in Mexico, I think a lot of them are Chinese owned and they realize, look, we're not going to be like this sentiment uh, that's that's negative between. And I think it's bilateral. I think it's uh, you know, I think there is a lot of political tension in both directions between China and U.S. There are a lot of very smart uh, businessmen in, uh, in, in China that realize that um, that they may have to build factories in Mexico in order to make it more palatable. Uh, to where things are going, right? So I think that Mexico is already uh, a manufacturing powerhouse. I hope to see them do a lot more. I think the demand is going to be there. What I really want to see is, and by the way, even in Mexico, go south, right? And the, and the further south you go, you you reach Puebla and, uh, and Oaxaca. Uh, and all of a sudden, we don't have any factories in those regions at all, right? So there are, you know, the, the people th talk about China this way as, as if China is one big place. Look, coastal China is more expensive. Interior China is much less expensive labor-wise. Same exact thing happens in Mexico. Um, there is a long way to go for 
uh, Mexico to really industrialize the rest of their country. I'd love to see Central America uh, get more serious about manufacturing. Same thing uh, goes for South America as well, right? So I think um, all of these countries need to realize that, you know, maybe in the last 30 years or so, for whatever reason, there's been this maniacal drive to offshore to Asia. I think at this point, people would love to be able to build anywhere in either of the American continents, but they need factories to, to be there, right? Yeah. Precisely right. Precisely right. So, so then, how do you expect this movement to develop next year? And and are are there any particular issues that you could see that may have a, a kind of an accelerating or decelerating impact on it? Uh, it's already you know the trains already left the station and we already see it happening. So, uh, I, by the way, I would not say that it's uh, you know, and we do have headlines that say this company is now focused on uh, exshoring and they're moving from somewhere to somewhere else. We actually don't see things like we don't have customers coming to us saying we have an uh, have an exshoring objective. That's not really how our conversations start. In fact, um, the, this isn't even the primary conversation. It's on the list of objectives for customers, right? They want a more resilient supply chain. They want to look. They want it to be cheaper, right? They don't want to pay money for shipping. They want to spend that money more on manufacturing and quality control, right? So they're looking for a better solution, more predictable supply chain, and they know that the route through that is through exshoring. That that could be in U.S., could be uh, could be in Mexico, could be in one of the other countries. So I think on that basis, things have already started to happen, and I think we see things moving in the right direction. Uh, I would love to see more uh, executives in a C-suite make this a corporate objective. I don't think I've seen that enough yet. Uh, so I see it as one of the objectives on the list. But I don't see uh, kind of a um, blanket support for supply chain people to go do what needs to be done, right? Uh, I don't. I haven't seen that yet. So I see it on a list as look at uh, among the five things we want to get done. Bring you closer to home is on a, is on a list of those things, right? I would love for it to be a more strategic objective going forward. Yeah. Yeah, and I like that you underscore there. You know, the cost is still. It may not be the 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 number one objective, but it's always in the top three or four, isn't it? So, uh, and that's the way business always is. So, you know, the, it, it absolutely is, and 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 I think cost these days can't really be cannot be discussed without uh, discussion about interest rates. And I, by the way, I think the interest rates are going to have a bigger impact on a supply chain. Uh, and how things work, even that I think than geopolitical conversations, right? At, at the end of the day, uh, we, we're we coming off an environment where manufacturers were able to go get very low interest loans, or in some cases, just use distribution for very favorable payment terms because interest rates were in low single digits. And that's just not the case anymore. The cost of capital has increased for everybody. So the biggest changes I see out there are, you know, a lot of them are about where things get built. But we're also more and more working with customers that understand that suppliers are strategic partners. They have working capital needs like everybody else. Um, so I think the shock of adjusting to high interest rates is going to be more disruptive than most people realize, right? Unless the Fed cuts rates back to, you know, three to four percent range, I think the interest rates are going to be much a much bigger deal than most people realize. Yeah. No, I think that's an astute observation. I think you're probably going to be spot on with that one. So, um, yeah, it's an ever-changing thing. I think, you know, next year we, and we also have some elections next year, both in this country and in Mexico, they could, you know, potentially have an impact, you know, as, um, so we get to see, and, and like you say, stay resilient, stay flexible, and uh, you, you got to build for whatever comes. You know, I spend more time in Mexico now, so I get to have more conversations with locals. It, it's really interesting. They were very worried that the last administration uh, in Mexico was going to be very detrimental to, to business and, yeah. you know, socialist, uh, uh, right, uh, uh, for all intents and purposes. It really hasn't slowed down trade much at all. In fact, I think uh, a lot of people that were worried about, you know, just kind of catastrophic uh, policies that were going to be enacted, none of the dire predictions really came to be, Right. Um, so I think at the end of the day, um, look, there is true socialists out there. I don't think there is a whole lot of them on this continent, uh, right? Uh, so, you know, when, when, I think we need to separate some of the political rhetoric from what's actually happening, whether it's uh, whether it's Trump or Biden, 
nothing's really changed from the perspective of push towards supply chain resilience and really decoupling. When I say decoupling, I don't mean divorce, right? I mean rebalancing from Asia as as a world factory. That's not healthy. And I think we're we're you know the, this may get packaged in either more inflammatory uh, rhetoric or less inflammatory rhetoric, right? But at the end of the day, the effect's going to be the same. We are heading in an opposite direction. We're going to be a lot. There's going to be less world trade, and there's. I think we're going to be moving raw materials around. But I think more and more local production is going to come home, right? Yeah. Misha, you are always uh, a wise voice on these topics, and I. That's why I appreciate it. And I. I got to say before we end that we got to do this a little more often than last time. You know, <laughs> so it's happy, uh, to, happy to do it in your time. You know, it's a. Uh, it's easy to make predictions. I think the the real work gets down on the ground, you know, you still got to go convince customers that, um, exactly. you know, they're not going to, uh, they, they, they can achieve their objectives, but in a different country with higher quality and better outcomes, that's where the real hard work comes into play. So, you know, the, the ironic thing is we still don't have a lot of people willing to go out there and tell their success stories, right? And if you ask them why, you know, like I, I've asked customers, like, how come you don't want to talk to these reporters? Like, you know, Wall mm -hmm. Street Journal and, and other media outlets want to talk to to a lot of our customers. In reality, they're very cautiously approaching this uh, X-shoring uh, uh, um, uh, phenomenon, right? They're, they don't want to upset their key suppliers in China. Uh, they want to make changes. They want to be ready. But are yeah. they ready to go public and talk about it? Not yet, right? So I think uh, we're at a, at a very beginning of a very, very long process. I mean, how long did it take for us to reach to offshore to this degree? Offshore. It's going to take as long to 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 reshore back right yeah now i think that's a proper perspective and and the timeline sounds probably about right so um uh misha thank you this has been this is i enjoy our conversations you're a true thought leader on these subjects and it's clearly that you come from your business affords you those insights and that's uh what gives great value to your voice so thank we'll, you for we'll, your i hope to share the next new perspective with you next time we're always meeting with yep. customers and we're always hearing uh, how they're thinking about things. So uh, I'll, I'll let you know when things change. Please do. Please do. And listen, I know we're beginning December here. So let me wish you a successful and uh, good end to the year and happy holidays. Same to you, Eric. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Misha.